Welcome to the By Way of Commandment podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the finer points of his doctrine. Join us as we study the gospel through the scriptures and standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Welcome everyone to the By Way of Commandment podcast. I am your host, Jacob Ryder. Um, if you're a returning viewer, thank you very much for coming back. And if you're new to the channel, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. It helps the algorithm. It helps to spread the message of the gospel and it helps to build the community of watchers um, that we're trying to build here. Those of us who are interested in studying the scriptures, particularly surrounding the last days and the second coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So um, with that said, if you'd like to support the channel in some way, please consider subscribing to the channel and sharing these episodes with friends and loved ones uh, to help us build that community around uh, studying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, wow, okay, so General Conference was this previous weekend, and I know many other channels have put up their kind of reviews or their um, videos about uh, General Conference and their personal thoughts. Um, I'm a little late to the game. I missed a lot of general conference, particularly on Saturday I was working. Um, so I've been playing catch up, um, listening to general conference the last several days. And, um, wow. So there was a lot of really fantastic talks. Um, and I want to talk about just a couple of them. Uh, many of them you've, the many of other videos and things that people have put out about general conference this last weekend have talked a lot about um, Elder Bednar's talk, which I want to get into and add maybe kind of my two cents to it. And then um, obviously uh, Elder Holland's talk about the cross and all that stuff. Uh, very, very interesting, very important. Um, so there's, there's a lot to talk about and we're not going to be able to talk about all of it today but I do want to give kind of my two cents and my little recap of General Conference as I've listened to it thus far. And like I said, I haven't finished watching all of General Conference yet. I'm still catching up. Um, and I hope to talk a little bit more about General Conference in future videos as well. I do want to mention uh, this week, actually um, Tuesday evening the 4th into uh, Wednesday the 5th of October was Yom Kippur. So shalom and, and happy Yom Kippur to our Jewish friends. Um, this is the holiest day of the year in the biblical calendar. Uh, the Moedim, the appointed times of the Lord. So um, I know as Latter-day Saints and Christians generally, we don't necessarily celebrate these biblical holy days or feast days, um, at least not in the same way that um, our Jewish brothers and sisters do or have. Um, but I think it's important to note that several of these biblical holy days still have uh, relevance and meaning today, even for Christians. Um, we've just kind of over the centuries have lost that, um, that connection, I think. Um, we know that the early uh, saints, the apostles, also worshipped and uh, celebrated these feast days, these holy days, um, being that they were Jewish. And many of the early Christians were Jewish. It really wasn't until uh, the Gentile mission missionary service or missionary work when you started introducing Gentiles to the gospel of Jesus Christ and bringing them into the fold of Christ that some of these uniquely Jewish holidays and celebrations um, were sort of tweaked and changed or omitted from the everyday service or, or worship of the church. And obviously, um, over time, we know that most Christians today don't really understand or celebrate in any real capacity the biblical holy days, the Moedim. And so I'll do at some point a video about the different specific reference to the Savior and his sacrifice, his atonement, and his mission as our Savior and as the Messiah. Um, and so as we look through each of the holy days, both the 
spring holy days and the uh, fall holy days, we see the within the actual worship and and traditions focused on each of these holy days, we see the representation of Christ. And so I'll do at some point a, f- a video all about that. But I, we had this week on Tuesday and Wednesday Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day of the year, a day in which all Israel was to fast and pray and recognize that they of themselves can do nothing, but they need God to redeem them. That ultimately is God who has to make that final and infinite atonement for them. And so that is represented by the high priest of all Israel who would offer a sacrifice not only for himself to cleanse himself and be purified of his personal sin and iniquity so that he could be counted worthy to go into the temple and make a sacrifice, uh, appropriate sacrifice for all of Israel. Um, This is echoed into the New Testament where we have the Savior Jesus Christ who is represented as not only the Lamb of God, right, the sacrifice himself, the infinite and uh, atoning sacrifice for all Israel, and not just Israel, but for the world generally, all those who accept Christ. Um, He has offered himself a sacrifice on our behalf, an infinite atoning sacrifice, so that we can be forgiven of sin. But we also see him take on the role as our great high priest Um, in the book of Hebrews, or the, the letter to the Hebrews. In the New Testament, uh, we have this idea repeated in several places where Christ himself is not only the Lamb of God, the sacrifice himself, but he is also our great high priest um, who goes and performs that sacrifice. So um, very interesting. I'll have to do, again, at some point, a video on all of that. Um, But today, I want to talk about General Conference and a few things that I've noticed over General Conference. I haven't listened to a lot of other YouTubers or podcasters talk about their recaps of General Conference. So I apologize if I kind of uh, step on the toes of these other uh, podcasters and YouTubers and their, their, um, their recaps of General Conference. Um... But I'm just going to tell you things that stood out to me and and things that I've noticed. So right off the bat, um, there's a few different themes I noticed in General Conference uh, this weekend. And I think one of the biggest themes I noticed was strengthening your testimony and strengthening your testimony through covenants. Um, That is, to me, what stood out as the, the overarching focus of this general conference and for all those who are struggling in their testimony or who have left the church or who are struggling in some some way with their testimony they're wrestling with themselves um, to put forth the effort to strengthen their testimony and so that seems to be uh, at least in my mind the overarching theme of everything there's certainly other themes that we can touch on as well that I noticed, but that seems to be the biggie. And I think if I had to pick one talk that kind of um, exemplified or encapsulated this entire theme, it would probably be Elder Bednar's talk, which I want to talk about. Um, But first, I have this verse that he used in that talk that I pulled up from Isaiah chapter 52. Um, This is specifically a prophecy about the last days, um, the building of Zion, uh, Israel's redemption, as you can see in the notes here, or the chapter heading. And he, Elder Bednar used this um, couple of verses here. And I just want to read this because I think this is really at the heart of the message of this conference. Starting in verse 1, uh, it says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean shake thyself from the dust arise and sit down O jerusalem 
Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. So we have this idea in these two verses. Uh, Zion, the people of Zion, or Israel, are being shaken uh, or are being awakened. They, for whatever reason, uh, up, the, up to this point, we have several verses after this, which I'm not going to read, but I would encourage you to go read this chapter, which is um, uh, really fantastic. It's not very long either. But we have this idea that Israel has not fulfilled their duties. They have um, polluted themselves. They've sold themselves for worldly things. They have neglected the gospel and the um, their covenants. They've broken their covenants. And so here in these last days, as they're being gathered, the Lord is calling to Israel to awake. And he's shaking them awake. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. Um, shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. This is all about Latter-day Covenant Israel being um, admonished by the Lord for our iniquities, for our slothfulness, um, and being told that we need to wake up, that we need to put on our strength and put on our beautiful garments. Um, and he gives the warning for henceforth, meaning from this point on, there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and unclean. So all those who will not keep the covenants and the commandments of God, who will not serve him, can no more from this point on come into Zion. The Zion must be the pure in heart. So that that is that is to me the the big verse of scripture from this general conference. We are being admonished as a church to wake the heck up and realize what's going on, realize what time it is and what day and age we live and to stop focusing on the things of the world and put on our garments and put on our strength and go forth and keep the commandments and the covenants of God. Um, that, that to me is the big idea here of this conference and what the general authorities are telling us. So I have, I want to go through a little bit of conference here, just a couple talks and not even all the whole talks necessarily, but this is, um, one of, this is overcome the world and find rest. This is a talk from president Nelson. Um, this is the longer of his talks, the longest of his talks from general conference. And right off the bat in the beginning here, he talks about the blessings that are promised to us as followers of Jesus Christ. And I want to read just a little bit of this. He says, let's see, right here, starting in this paragraph, my dear brothers and sisters, so many wonderful things are ahead. In coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns, with power and great glory, he will bestow countless, bless countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. Okay, he's touched on this several times in the last few years, um, many times actually. And he said this almost verbatim in previous talks between now and the time that the savior returns, we will see the greatest blessings and miracles poured out upon the faithful, not upon the world, upon the faithful. Okay. It says, nonetheless, we are presently living in what 
surely is the most complicated time in the history of the world. The complexities and challenges leave many people feeling overwhelmed and exhausted. However, consider a recent experience that might shed light on how you and I can find rest. During the recent open house of the Washington DC temple, a member of the open house committee witnessed an insightful interchange as he escorted several prominent journalists through the temple. Somehow a young family became attached to this media tour. One reporter kept asking about the journey of a temple patron as he or she moves through the temple. He wanted to know if the temple journey is symbolic of the challenges in a person's journey through life. And you and I know anybody who's been through the temple knows exactly what he's talking about. The uh, different rooms of the temple that you progress through in uh, an endowment session, for example, has many layers of meaning, not the least of which is uh, a metaphorically um, our own personal journey as human beings coming to this earth and experiencing life, struggle, um, and, and all those things associated with life in mortality and progressing through our life and into the eternities. He goes on and says, a young boy in the family picked up on the conversation. When the tour group entered an endowment room, the boy pointed to the altar where people kneel to make covenants with God and said, oh, that's nice. Here's a place for people to rest on their temple journey. I doubt the boy knew just how profound his observation was. He likely had no idea about the direct, direct connection between making a covenant with God in the temple and the Savior's stunning promise. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Dear brothers and sisters, I grieve for those who leave the church because they feel membership requires too much of them. They have not yet discovered that making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. Um, and I would just add, I think it makes life more rich and full and fulfilling when you've made covenants with God. When you understand the purpose of those covenants and you understand our purpose for being here and experiencing mortality and what that has to do with our eventual destiny. The covenants that we make with our Heavenly Father help make life more meaningful. He continues, uh, each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts and in temples and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ. Please ponder that stunning truth. So that's something that I'm going to take upon myself as a kind of a challenge is to write this part down in my notebook and ponder this truth that he's talking about. So I'm going to actually kind of do my own personal scripture search or scripture study on this particular topic, just personal for me. Um, but anytime you have uh, the president of the church, the prophet, ask us to ponder something or ask us to really sit down and think about something uh, or study a particular topic, um, it's probably best that we write that down and we take the time to do that. Um, I know that I've been slothful in that regard um, on a number of occasions and have kind of just like let it go. I remember when I was younger, um, President Hinckley asking all of us to read the Book of Mormon by Christmas. And he did that a couple times. And um, I didn't really do that until... Uh, well, I probably didn't do that until, um, really until my mission, if I'm being honest. I didn't really study the Book of Mormon until I was um, a little bit older and President uh, Hinckley had already passed away and um, President Monson had become the president of the church. 
Um, and so I can go back now and listen to these talks of President Hinckley and, and others, um, even before him, making promises to the membership of the church and asking us to kind of do our part and study certain things, study the Book of Mormon. Ezra Taft Benson was huge on every member needs to study the Book of Mormon um, and read it every day. Things like that, these promises that are made by presidents of the church are not just these, you know, flippant or um, light things. They're making us a promise. They're asking us to do something that will benefit us and promising us with an apostolic promise of the blessings that can come when we take the time to do those things. And all, everything that they ask us to do in, that, in this regard is to study scriptures, to focus on a particular aspect of the doctrine, or to study certain things that always help us point ourselves to the Savior. I'm just going to read this last little um, bit here from this talk. It says, The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his higher power. I talked about this on my video from last week on becoming a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And I've talked about it on a number of occasions before that, this idea of living the higher law or living the celestial law. We have greater access to the power of God when we keep our covenants and live the higher law. So thus, covenant keepers are entitled to a special kind of rest that comes to them through their covenantal relationship with God. Before the Savior, Savior submitted himself to the agony of Gethsemane and Calvary, he declared to his apostles, quote, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Subsequently, Jesus entreated each of us to do the same when he said, I will that ye should overcome the world. And we overcome the world through the blood of the Lamb, through washing our garments in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, by accepting the conditions of repentance and exercising faith in him continually to make and keep covenants with God. That is where that power to overcome the world comes. So I want to I want to go over here. So we have we have um, President Nelson's talks, and I th he gave several talks over General Conference, which he almost always does. Um, all were great, and all had very different um, messages to them. But the overarching message that he gives in every single talk is follow Christ, make and keep covenants with God and exercise faith in Christ continually. Um, that is the overarching theme of every talk that he gives. Um, as it should be, as, as president of the Lord's church, he points us to the Lord. Um, but it's interesting that he also uh, talks about the second coming. Almost, ev not necessarily every single talk that he's given, but certainly every single general conference especially since he's become president of the church. Um, I do want to mention, okay, this is, this is his last talk that ended General Conference on Sunday. Um, focus on the temple. He gave a, a list of temples that are to be built. Always exciting. Um, but something that I noticed and my wife noticed at the end of this talk 
Um, and you probably all noticed it as well. In fact, um, as soon as general conference ended on Sunday afternoon, um, my wife had seen on some of her Facebook groups, um, a number of people commenting about this talk and you probably know what I'm getting at here, but at the end of this conference talk at the end of general conference on Sunday afternoon, after, uh, president Nelson had, um, well, he, he two things I want to mention about this talk. One, if you didn't, think that he had the second coming of Christ in mind, um, then I don't know what to tell you, but in this particular talk, he shared that clip from the Book of Mormon videos of the Savior's visit to the Nephites um, found in Third Nephi. And he shared his excitement and the inspiration that he received when he and Sister Nelson had watched uh, this this clip from the, the Book of Mormon videos. Um, this is a church president who is very excited about the second coming of Christ and who, uh, now I don't know him personally, but I would, I would assume that from all of the talks that we have of President Nelson during his time as president of the church, he has talked about the second coming every general conference and usually multiple times in different talks in, gen in each general conference. And uh, he is preparing us to be a Zion people. And I think it's because of this idea here that we are very, very close to the second coming of Christ. And he knows that. I'm not saying he knows the day or the hour that the Savior will come. But he knows what season we're in. And he knows that we're getting very close. And he's trying to show us and share with us everything he can to help us to become that Zion people so that we can be prepared for his coming. Now, the other thing I want to mention about this talk that many of you also notice as well is at the very end of the talk, he gets very emotional. And um, he, well, for one, just listening to it. I'm not going to play it for you. You can go um, play it on your own and listen to it. But if you skip down to the very end of his talk, he gets very emotional and he gives an apostolic and prophetic blessing to the church, to each of us uh, in the church. And he expresses his love for each of us in the church. And I'll just say this. President Nelson loves the church. He does. I don't think you could watch this talk and come away feeling like, oh, he he's, doesn't really care about the church or he doesn't care about me or, or anything I'm struggling with in my own life. Just because he's the president of the church, he might not know all of us personally. He doesn't know us all by name. Um doesn't mean anything to him. I, I think his love for the church and its membership is, um, is sincere and is deep. And then he says, um, he gets kind of choked up and, and says, God be with you till we meet again. And of course, the conference ends with the choir singing that, that very hymn. Something that I felt and my wife felt, we kind of looked at each other um, at the end of this talk to confirm that, are, are you feeling what I'm feeling from that? And something that has been pointed out by many of you um, is that there seems to be this sort of feeling that um, President Nelson was saying goodbye 
Now, I'm not going to speculate as to his um, his health condition. I'm not going to speculate as to whether or not um, I, I think he's going to um, live uh, however much longer. Um, but I did feel like there was something more to that. And I don't know if that, if, if he knows something that he's not telling us about his own health or whatever it is, but it seemed to me and my wife and to many of you that it was almost kind of President Nelson saying goodbye to the church. Um, I certainly hope not. I, I hope that he's around for much longer. I know he's 98 years old but he looks fantastic for 98 and he carries himself very well and he's very sharp uh, mentally and I hope we see him around for, for uh, much longer. Um, however the lo- long the Lord uh, will let us have him um, because I, I, I love President Nelson. Um, I really do. I think he's... Um, we're not supposed to have favorites, right? But... He's up there in my book, and, and I really do love President Nelson. And I hope we see him for uh, more years to come. But I do feel that it was very, um, it was a very weird feeling that I had when he ended his talk in that manner. So that's, that's all I'll say about that. I'm not going to go any further into that. So now into the kind of the meat and potatoes of... Um, what I got out of this conference really came from this talk here. This is Elder Bednar's talk, Put on thy strength, O Zion. And we read those verses in Isaiah 52 um, at the beginning of this video, this episode. Um, He starts the talk obviously talking about parables and the intent of parables, why the Savior spent so much time and effort uh, speaking to the people in parables and not just kind of outright, um, not, not just speaking super clearly about everything um, all the time. There's a reason he spoke in parables. Um, and it says right here in this paragraph, um, Elder Bednar explains, the intended meaning or message of a parable typically is not expressed explicitly. Rather, The story only conveys divine truth to a receiver in proportion to his or her faith in God, personal spiritual preparation, and their willingness to learn. Okay, very key, right, when trying to understand the meaning of the parables that the Savior gives. Um, The parables and our understanding of their meaning comes in proportion to our faith in God, our personal spiritual preparation, and our willingness to learn. Thus, an individual must exercise moral agency and actively ask, seek, and knock to discover the truths embedded in a parable. I earnestly pray that the Holy Ghost will enlighten each of us as we now consider the importance of the parable of the royal marriage feast. Okay. I'm going to have to go look and um, look this up myself after this episode. But to my knowledge, the parable of the royal marriage feast is not a parable that is spoken of often in general conference. Um, let me know in the comments below uh, if you can remember a talk in which this parable was given during a general conference. Um, But off the top of my head, I don't remember or recall any previous general conference talk with this specific parable given and explained. Um, I don't. That doesn't mean that it hasn't happened, um, just that I can't remember any off the top of my head. So if you do, if you know of any talks that I should go look at that have this particular parable, Um, please let me know in the comments. I'll be happy to look that up. So Elder Bednar goes on to 
give the parable of the royal marriage feast. And there's some there's some very important um, golden nuggets of info here in this parable. With, again, as a parable, has several layers uh, and depth of meaning. Um, so I'm going to go through some of this parable here and kind of give my two cents um, on some of the impressions and things that I felt when I was listening to this talk. Um, and it starts out, And Jesus spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Um, so right off the bat, we have a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Um, I think when we hear king, we automatically associate that with the Savior, with Jesus Christ. Um, and rightly so. But I think in this parable, my, my personal impressions are the king is actually God the Father who's making the, um, the marriage between his son, the bridegroom, and the bride. And in other parables and in other scriptures, we know that the bridegroom is represented by Jesus Christ, and the bride is his church. Um, any, any scriptures that we might think of, particularly to do with the second coming and um, being quickened up, the as m most other Christians would call it, the rapture, right? The rapture of... Uh, the church being caught up to meet the Lord um, at his coming. And we have the actual marriage supper uh, or, or marriage of the Lord and his church. Um, so it, it just my own personal kind of feelings is the king in this parable is God the Father and the son is the son, is his, the Savior Jesus Christ. Um, but the parable is not really about or at least not necessarily about the the son and and um, the the marriage so much as it is about those who are invited to that marriage, which is us, right? So the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Okay, so we know in um, in these parables and within the, the context of uh, Jewish life, um, these invitations were sent out months in advance. They were sent out um, many days in advance, so people would have um, ample time to prepare themselves for the day of the wedding. Um, and then again, we would have another invitation would go out the day of, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, as Elder Bednar talks about it further. But it says here that the king sent forth his servants, prophets, apostles, missionaries, right? To call them that were bidden to the wedding, right? The invitation has gone out to the world, um, or to, to all those whom the king would have at his son's wedding, um, and they would not come. Okay. To me, this is another way of basically saying that most of the world is not, is not going to be there. The majority of the world is not going to come to the wedding of the bridegroom and the bride. Um, they'll reject the invitation. Right? It goes on and says, And he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, My oxen and my fatlings are killed, And all things are ready, Come unto the marriage. So, so we have this king 
sending out his servants again to go tell those who were originally invited the the dinner is already prepared and not only is it prepared but it's prepared with oxen and the fatlings um these this is not a small little um get together this is a wedding feast a marriage feast this is um, a big deal and this is not just anybody who's getting married this is the king's son so you know that this this feast is going to be ornate and elaborate and is going to be beautiful and grand right and he's sending his servants out okay go tell them again to come it says but they made light of it and went their ways one to his farm and another to his merchandise and elder bednar goes on he says in ancient times one of the most joyous occasions in jewish life was a wedding celebration an event that would span a week or even two such an event required extensive planning and guests were informed far in advance with a reminder sent on the opening day of the festivities an invitation from a king to his subjects to a wedding such as this was essentially considered a command yet many of the bidden guests in this parable did not come we already mentioned that a minute ago um, the invitation most people will not accept the invitation to come unto christ and to be there for the wedding feast right the refusal to attend the king's feast was a deliberate act of rebellion against royal authority and a personal indignity against both the reigning sovereign and his son. The turning away by one man to his farm and by another to his business interests reflects their misguided priorities and total disregard of the king's will. The parable continues. I think this next bit here is a little bit uh, more interesting, I have a little bit more to say about this. It says, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. The custom in those days was for the host of a wedding feast in this parable the king to provide garments for the wedding guests. Such wedding garments were simple, nondescript robes that all attendees wore. In this way, rank and station were eliminated and everyone at the feast could mingle as equals. People invited from the highways to attend the wedding would not have had the time or means to procure appropriate attire in preparation for the event. Consequently, the king likely gave guests the garments from his own wardrobe. Everyone was given the opportunity to clothe themselves in the garments of royalty. As the king entered the wedding hall, he surveyed the audience and immediately noticed that one conspicuous guest was not wearing a wedding garment. The man was brought forward, and the king asked, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. In essence, the king asked, Why are you not wearing a wedding garment, even though one was provided for you? Okay, I, I want to talk about that for a second. Um, we have the wedding garment being required by all guests who enter into the wedding feast the celebration the king himself is providing the attendees with his own garments and not only that but each of these garments that are worn by the attendees is essentially meant to convey that everyone is on equal footing. Everyone is, there, there's no rank or station. 
um, being shown in their dress. Everyone has on the same wedding attire, the same garment, and all are seen as on equal footing in the eyes of the king and his son during the marriage feast. Okay? When we enter into covenant with God, when we enter into the holy temples of the Lord, the house of the Lord, we do so we we enlist this idea that we are all there to serve the Lord and each other and all are alike unto God. God is no respecter of persons. When we go to the temple, you could be sitting next to President Nelson. You could be sitting next to your stake president. You could be sitting next to, um, you know, anybody in your local ward. When you go to the temple, it does not matter. We are all wearing the same garments, the same uh, temple attire, and we are all there to perform the same service and the same ordinances and make the same covenants. And in that moment, all of our rank and station, all of our wealth, all of those things fall by the wayside. They are left at the doors of the temple. When we enter into the temple, we are all there for the same purpose, to serve one another and to serve those uh, on the other side of the veil by um, by performing the ordinances of salvation and exaltation. So we are all alike unto God in the temple. And we will all be alike unto God, those of us who are worthy and have accepted the invitation during the millennium and during the second coming when we are caught up to meet the Lord. So this, this little bit here of the man who did not have the wedding garment, uh, despite being provided one, is an important point. Elder Bednar goes on to say, the man obviously was not dressed properly for this special occasion, and the phrase, and he was speechless, indicates that the man was without excuse. Elder James E. Talmadge provides this instructive commentary about the significance of the man's actions. That the unrobed guest was guilty of neglect, intentional disrespect, or some more grievous offense is plain from the context. The king at first was graciously considerate, inquiring only as to how the man had entered without a wedding garment. Had the guest been able to explain his exceptional appearance, or had he any reasonable excuse to offer, he surely would have spoken. But we are told that he remained speechless. The king's summons had been freely extended to all whom his servants had found, but each of them had to enter the royal palace by the door. And before reaching the banquet room, in which the king would appear in person, each would be properly attired. But the deficient one, by some means, had entered by another way, and not having passed the attendant sentinels at the portal, he was an intruder. A Christian author, John O'Reed, noted that the man's refusal to wear the wedding garment exemplified blatant disrespect for both the king and his son. He did not simply lack a wedding garment. Rather, he chose not to wear one. He rebelliously refused to dress appropriately for the occasion. The king's reaction was swift and decisive. Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The king's judgment of the man is not based primarily upon the lack of a wedding garment, but that he was in fact determined not to wear one. The man desired the honor of attending the wedding feast, but did not want to follow the custom of the king. He wanted to do things his own way. 
His lack of proper dress revealed his inner rebellion against the king and his instructions. And I'm not going to read the rest of this talk, um, but he goes on to talk about the this idea of many are called, but few are chosen. Um, very important, but I want to go here. This is Doctrine and Covenants section one. So this idea of the the man who entered in by some other way, he was at the wedding of feast in attendance, but refused to wear the the garment provided by the king. He wanted to do things his own way, um, but he wanted all of the privileges and blessings of being in attendance at the wedding feast. Um, so we can talk about a couple different things here, but one thing that I want to make mention of is this to me, this whole parable is about the second coming of Christ. This is about the time when the church will be quote unquote raptured to meet the Lord at his coming. We'll be quickened and caught up to meet him. Um, and even beyond that, it's about the millennium and those who choose to follow Christ now and make covenants with him or with our heavenly father uh, by the proper priesthood authority and who honor those covenants will be prepared and ready to meet him at his coming and to serve him during the millennium. Um, this is Doctrine and Covenants section one. And I'm going to read a few verses here. Starting in verse 12, it says, Prepare ye, prepare ye for that which is to come, for the Lord is nigh. And the anger of the Lord is kindled, and his sword is bathed in heaven, and it shall fall upon the inhabitants of the earth. And the arm of the Lord shall be revealed, and the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. And why is that? Verse 15 says, For they have strayed from mine ordinances and have broken mine everlasting covenant. They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world and whose substance is that of an idol which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. This man in the parable of the wedding feast, like many of us and many members of the church and uh, many uh, in the world generally, we seek to do things our own way. We seek not the Lord and his counsel and his wisdom, but we seek to give counsel to the Lord. Right? We have an idea of how life is supposed to be, and we see these restrictions that the Lord places upon us, or uh, places upon those of us who enter into covenant with him, and we don't want to have to deal with that. We don't, we don't like some of these restrictions. We don't like some of these commandments. And so, you know, I, I want the blessings that come from living the gospel. I want the eternal life. I want to go to heaven. Um, I want to be present uh, when the Lord comes. Or I want to be at least protected from all of the bad things that are supposed to happen before the second coming. You know, but I don't want to keep all of the commandments. I have a few things here and there that I don't like about the commandments or um, that I don't like about church service or whatever it is, and we justify ourselves into living in a manner that is not conducive to the commandments of the Lord. We walk in our own way and after the image of our own God, who's in the likeness of the world. Verse 15, I've talked about this before. Um, this, I believe, I might have talked about on the first episode of the podcast, over a year ago. This is section one of the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, this is early on in, in the church. Um, 1832, I believe. 
And the Lord is speaking kind of in a present or past tense here, but talking about the future of the church. He says, For they have strayed from mine ordinances and have broken mine everlasting covenant. Talking about members of the church. Members of the church who have already entered into covenant with God through his ordinances. Otherwise, you can't break a covenant that you haven't made. You can't stray from ordinances that you haven't performed. That's plain and simple. So these are people within the church who have already made covenants and through those ordinances and have strayed from them and broken their covenants. Um, that brings me to Doctrine and Covenants section 112. Uh, and this is starting in verse 24. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation. And as a whirlwind, it shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord. And this, this next part is important. It says, And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First, among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. So this day of vengeance, of wrath, of burning, of desolation, weeping and mourning and lamentation, this is the second coming of Christ. This is the day when the wicked are burned up at his coming. The Lord is telling us that all of these things in 20, verse 24, the wrath and burning, the desolation, all that, it shall begin upon his house, upon the temple. And from my house shall it go forth. Okay? These are people who have entered into the house of the Lord and have made covenants with him, but who have broken those covenants. In verse 26, first among those among you, so members of the church, who have professed to know my name and have not known me and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, those who have entered into the house of the Lord unworthily and who have blasphemed against the Lord in doing so. Those are those who are in the church who will experience this day of wrath and burning, et cetera, et cetera, um, before the rest of the world is burned out, um, however that looks, um, however that the Lord chooses to, to play that out. But that's the promise that the Lord is making here, the warning that he's making. This isn't just um, all these parables in the New Testament uh, and in the scriptures generally. Most of them have to do with those who are already members of the church. Um, and, and we could look at that as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, um, the restored church the one true church, or as Christianity generally, those who profess belief and worship in Christ. Um, many of the parables actually have less to do with uh, comparing the believers um, and members of the church to the rest of the outside world who are not believers. Most of the parables seem to be more about sifting through the believers to find those who truly believe and those who don't. The, the, the parable of the wedding feast here talked about in this conference talk by Elder Bednar, the, the guy who entered into the, the wedding feast, he did so by some other way, but he was there. 
He was there in the walls and in attendance, just like everybody else who had been invited and accepted the invitation. He accepted the invitation somehow and somehow made it through some other way. That man in that parable is the same exact scenario that the Lord is talking about here in DNC 112. Those who entered in to the midst of the Lord's house or to the midst of his wedding feast, who professed to know his name, but had not known him and have blasphemed against him. Um, that's the danger here, brothers and sisters, of trying to do things our own way. And it goes back to President Nelson's earlier, um, to the talk that we read earlier. The covenants that we make with our Heavenly Father will bring rest to our souls and will make our lives richer and deeper and more meaningful and in many cases easier. Not always, not always easier. There's some difficulty in keeping the commandments. There's peer pressure. There's all sorts of other things going on in the world that are trying to pull us uh, in a different direction and have us break those commandments. Um, or at the very least, do not provide an environment that is um, conducive to living those commandments. Regardless, if we accept the invitation of the Lord, he expects us in return to do things his way. And that's the purpose of the covenants. That's the purpose of the house of the Lord, the temple is to provide us a place where we can learn uh, more about him and the plan of salvation and where we can make and keep covenants by, ordin by ordinances. I've talked about that ad nauseum at this point. Um, so I want to end this episode here. This is Matthew 25. I'm not going to read this whole parable, but this is the parable of the ten virgins. And I encourage everybody to go read this. Um, I believe it's also in Doctrine and Covenants section 45 as well, um, or somewhere around there. Um, but I believe it's section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants um, that gives some further insight into this particular parable. But I want to point out something. Whether we're talking about the um, parable of the wedding feast or the parable of the ten virgins... In either case, there is a wedding feast. The bridegroom is coming to get his bride and take her back to um, the place in which they will have the marriage feast, where they will be married together and have the big celebration. All are invited, but as we know from both of these parables, not everyone accepts the invitation. But to those who do accept the invitation, we can read further about them in both of these parables. Remember, the ten virgins, all ten of them were invited to the wedding feast and accepted the invitation. And they had, you know, uh, at least to some degree or another, prepared themselves for the wedding feast. And as mentioned in uh, Elder Edler Bednar's talk, the wedding invitations go out far in advance, giving people ample time to be prepared. And then again, on the day of, another uh, invitation is sent out. So there is no mistaking the day that the wedding feast is supposed to occur. Um, all who are invited and accept the invitation will know the day that the wedding is to occur, but they don't necessarily know the hour, as we see in the parable of the ten virgins. And so all ten virgins were invited and accepted the invitation to the wedding feast, but only five of them brought extra oil with them 
to last them the day and into the night until the time when the bridegroom would pass by um, and would they would all go in together into the wedding feast. So they're out there waiting for the bridegroom and his entourage to come by and take them all into the celebration. And when they've all gone in together, the doors are shut. The five who were foolish didn't bring enough oil. They were invited, they accepted the invitation, and they knew that it was that day. They didn't know the hour, so they were ha- they waited until, or they were going to wait until the uh, bridegroom and his entourage had passed by and, and were ready for them to all go in together, but they didn't bring enough oil. So even those of us members of the church who have made the covenants, we've been to the temple, we've put on our garments, um, as Isaiah says in, in Isaiah 52, we've put on our strength. Um, if we're not constantly um, doing those things that strengthen our testimony, bring that extra oil with us for the long journey, then we'll be left outside and the doors will be shut and we will not be fully prepared when he comes, despite the fact that we think we've made all the right decisions and have accepted the invitation. So it's just interesting to me that even the day of the, the celebration, the wedding feast, a further in, another invitation has gone out to all those who are waiting and ready for the wedding feast. And they, the invitation goes out, okay, it's today. Is everybody ready? Okay, hang tight because we'll send another person out to let you know when the bridegroom is almost here and then we'll all go in together. My personal opinion and my personal feelings when I listen, in, when I listen to this general conference talk from... Elder Bednar, I have a strong feeling that the second coming of Christ is very soon. And he is, Elder Bednar, is essentially telling us, warning us that today's the day. We don't know the hour, but it's it's here. And this talk, I think, is kind of a final warning or final invitation, however you choose to see it, to all of us members of the church that, this, that today is the day of the wedding celebration and this is your final invitation to be ready. Because in an hour that you think not, the bridegroom comes. The overarching theme, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, of General Conference is to be prepared for the second coming and to strengthen our testimony. Whatever we have to do to strengthen our testimony, we need to do it and do it now. Um, That's my personal takeaway from General Conference. Again, I haven't listened to all of Conference yet. Um, So if there's other conference talks that you guys uh, listen to and, and were able to catch certain things and, and um, hear certain things from these talks that um, you think are really important and relevant to this, uh, to this subject, please let me know in the comments because I'd love to go back and listen to some of these talks again um, with your guys' insights. Um, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, so I love and appreciate when you guys have really good insights about these, uh, these topics. And it gives us something uh, further to look at and to consider. Um, but I want to say thank you to all of you for listening. Um, I will be back with another episode later this week, probably this weekend. Um, I've been um, going back and listening to these conference talks, so I may have some more further insight into some other talks um, in the coming week or two. Um, but again, if you have um, any talks or anything that you'd like me to listen to, or any insights that you have, please let me know in the comments section of this video. Um, I really appreciate it. I know other people do as well. 
Um, and we all learn a lot. And that's really the purpose of this channel is to build that community and learn from one another um, and study and uplift and edify one another with the gospel of Christ. So I want to say thank you to all of you who have listened. Again, please like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Um, it really helps build the community and get these messages out to more people so more people can see and become a part of this community of those who are studying the gospel of Christ and watching for his coming. And I'll catch you in the next video.